welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 132. Today, we're talking about Vue.js. I am one of your hosts today, Justin Ribeiro, and with me as always, Mr. Leon Rivel. Hello. And Mr. Danny Blue. Hey, everybody. And before we introduce our guest today, we're going to go to the news desk and talk this week in the web in two minutes or less. Leon, take it away. Thank you, Justin. So some brilliant news for you this week. Um, first of all, Microsoft's Edge Web Summit is now available for sign up. Um, so you can head over to there and, and start to get tickets. Um, the popular mobile JavaScript framework, Ionic, is uh, utilizing web components, which was announced um, a few days ago, which is great to, great to see. Um, on a similar note, um, Ionic's developer survey results are in, um, showing that there's a big increase in hybrid app development over previous years. A new version of the Web Components JS suite of polyfills, 103, is available, which has got various bug fixes and improvements. Angular 5 Beta 0 has dropped in GitHub, which is good to see. And Angular CL excuse me, Angular CLI has put out an emergency patch to lock down a downstream dependency. So if you're having production issues with Angular CLI, you need to update to 124 or 130 RC1. And that's everything we've got for you this week. Thank you, Leon. Some good stuff uh, coming out during the summer of all times. I mean, it's summertime. Is no one sitting on a lake? Apparently not. So things are getting done. I like it. But today, we're not talking about lakes, and we're not talking about sitting around doing nothing. Today, we're talking about Vue.js, and our guest today uh, needs no introduction, but I will let him introduce himself, Mr. Chad Campbell. Chad, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Justin. Um uh, my name's Chad Campbell. Uh, a lot of times I wish I was sitting at the lake, but um, when I'm not sitting at the lake, I guess uh, I serve as an independent software consultant. And so if you need help, please reach out to me. Um, I've got a lot of experience creating software. I've got a degree in computer science from Purdue. I've written a book, a couple training courses, and um, I was a five-time Microsoft MVP. At the moment, I'm focused on creating content that helps people create better software and getting it to more people. One of the technologies that I believe helps with that goal is Vue.js. Sounds like you've been very busy. Definitely no time to be sitting around at a lake. <laughs> right, right. But there's always time to sit at a lake, is my point. I, I, or, or, or an ocean, or some body of water that generally brings you bliss and joy. Because that's what development's really about. Now, that's some Zen stuff right there, ladies and gentlemen. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> Pain and tears. <laughs> now, see, your summer's going really well, Danny. <laughs> Look, it's fine. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. So <laughs> to get back on track to talk about Vue.js before we go off on some crazy tangent, um, uh, could uh, Chad, could you just give us a brief introduction as to what Vue.js is, what it's all about, and and you know set the scene? Sure. So Vue.js is a a progressive web framework for creating UIs. Um, there are a number of reasons, kind of why I like Vue myself. Uh, if I had to pick two of those reasons, I'd, I'd have to say it's probably because of its uh, simplicity and its speed. Um, in terms of simplicity, um, it, it's important to remember that Vue is a progressive framework. So this is significant because you can kind of gradually bring in features as you need them. Um, it, it's intuitive and, and helps you avoid some of the complexity seen with, with alternative frameworks um, uh, you can just kind of bring in these these features as you need them. So if you're building a small app, you can import a, a single small JavaScript file with a, a single script tag and use Vue's core features like template rendering and components. But um, as your app grows, your needs may also grow. And so you may need things like routing or state management. And and in those types of situations, you can you can wait to bring those in until you need them. But when you do need them, you just kind of plug them in, if you will. Um, I personally think that this this kind of benefits newer developers uh, and those with more experience because newer developers can create um, something and get started with what they know, and more experienced developers can kind of create more maintainable code. Um, in terms of view speed, well, there's there's a lot of 
Java, there's actually a JavaScript web framework benchmark that compares the speeds of the various frameworks. And so when compared against alternative frameworks like Angular or React, Vue actually outperforms them. So a lot of times it feels like JavaScript frameworks are a little bit of a, in, in a bit of a holy war. Um, if one thing we can all agree on, I think it's that everyone wants their code to run fast. And so I, I, th I think that speed story is, is really important. Yeah, you've got a got a lot of fast running code. Um, it, a lot of the comments I've seen about Vue.js is is as you said how simple it is. But also, um, one of the comments that comes up time and time again is how it you know it starts out simple. So the the getting started is simple. But then also you know when you start trying to solve complex problems, it still stays simple. Unlike a lot of other frameworks, which can often get quite complicated. Do you say would you say that's accurate? I, I would. I um, I feel like Vue has has done a great job of identifying those um, those pivot points inside of an app. And so, you know, routing being one of those, state management being one of those, server-side rendering being one. Um, it, it's just, it's really elegant and, and really smart the way that I, I feel it really comes together. Cool. So, um, uh, Vue's template syntax looks really, really similar to Angular 1's. Um, I mean, I, I even think that some of the, the names, you know, like, um, I think they still uh, they call up uh, uh, pipes filters. At least they used to. I, I, I honestly haven't looked at Vue in, in um, quite a, a little bit. So some of this stuff may have changed. But at least from what I remember, Views templates and text look very similar to Angular One. Um, do you think this was in? Do you think this was intentional, or did it just? This is just the solution that um, uh, that was arrived at. Um, so I, I do believe it was um, inspired by Angular. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Evan Yu, who is the the founder of of the View framework, and um, that's U Y O U, um, and, and so. Uh, I believe he worked on prototypes at Google. And so I don't know, but I would assume that he had experience with Angular um, as, as part of that. Um, and so myself personally, I actually did a lot of work with Angular 1.x, that whole story. And um, I would agree that it feels very similar to uh, the Angular templating syntax. And that was personally one of the draws for myself, I know. Yeah, there, there were some people that I know when Angular 2 was, uh, I guess like before it uh, it was officially out or anything and Vue was starting to gain some steam, a lot of people were like, well, Vue is what a lot of people wished Angular 2 was. Uh, you know, same, you know, very similar syntax, but, you know, uh, faster and all, all that good stuff under the hood. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. I, th I think when Angular 2 came out, they... Uh, I, I th for me personally, I kind of started to back away from Angular 2 primarily because um, the tooling story seemed to feel a bit more complex and it seemed to kind of be taking me away from the problems that I was really trying to solve. And so with Vue 2, um, I feel like I'm able to, you know, once again, focus on the problems that I'm trying to solve because I think like everybody, you know, we have, we have goals that we have to meet to, you know, whether it's clients or customers or whatever. And so Vue really helps me kind of tackle those goals head on. Awesome. No, I, I actually felt a, a similar. Um, I actually felt a similar way for a long time. I'm I, I, people that listen to the show or follow me online. They're like I'm. I'm actually a big fan of Angular in its current state. But I remember like especially when it first came out, and uh, like I got a first look at Vue. I was like, this feels comfortable and this feels familiar. Um, which which is awesome, and I think is actually one of the very very cool things about it is it's kind of taken some of the uh, the best parts of what you know Angular One was because that was a big thing with Angular One is that it, it's easy to get started, right? right. Um, but it kind of it started to fall apart as you got bigger, and it sounds like that's where you really shines, which is fantastic. I yeah, I completely agree. It just um, it just kind of lets you kind of gently walk in almost like you're in a pool, right? You, you don't have to just jump into the deep end with, with all the tooling and, uh, and various languages or whatever. You just kind of walk in and, you know, get deeper as you need to. That's a really nice feature. I think, you know, a lot of the frameworks nowadays, it can be quite daunting trying to get yourself set up or learn one of these new frameworks. And you've got so much, so many prerequisites, it can often put a lot of people off. Yeah, I think... I think that's kind of one of the challenges in the JavaScript community in general right now is because um, 
there's kind of a lot of dependencies, like everything is loosely coupled, which is great because it allows everything to innovate really, really rapidly. At the same time, if you're not familiar with it or if you're not keeping up to speed with it, I think the challenge is if you're just trying to l- figure out something, you know, to meet your your goal at hand, you know, you'll probably go to Google or whatever, type in your problem, and you may come across a blog post, but that blog post may be out of date in a way, you know, it, it may be some some stale stale code or whatever, and then you're not sure, you kind of lose confidence in yourself. And so with Vue, I haven't really experienced that as much. Um, it's really been a, a breath of fresh air, I feel. Yeah, unfortunately, as someone who has a very old blog post that still gets quite a bit of traffic in regards to things like that nature, it is quite tough. I mean, I have people asking me jQuery 1.3 questions because of a post I wrote back when jQuery 1.3 was still a thing. Um, and you end up with that gap and, and Vue has wonderful documentation in terms of walking through sort of the essential elements of how to get started. But the, the advanced section is actually quite convenient, um, for developers just coming onto the platform. I I agree more. As a matter of fact, when I, when I read the documentation, I, (laughs) I I kind of debated whether I should create a a course around it. Like I, I liked Vue and I was kicked around the idea of creating a training course for a while, but then the documentation was so good. I was like, well, how do I, how do I complement this and actually add value? And so I uh, dug in and found a way to do that, I feel. Um, but the the documentation on the VUE website is, is absolutely phenomenal and, and definitely worth taking a look at. That's one of the really important things about having a successful JavaScript framework, isn't it? Is making sure there's good quality documentation that people can refer to so they don't get stuck or lost really easily. So that's nice to hear. Yeah, if if you can get unblocked, man, that that goes such a long way. So you mentioned performance as well as one of like the key key points to view. So kind of, how does it achieve that? Does it use the virtual DOM or any other kind of you know obvious techniques to help improve the performance of your applications? So this is kind of one of the uh, the modern additions to Vue, I guess. Um, so with Vue two, which came out uh, mid two thousand sixteen, I believe. Um, the Vue team incorporate a virtual DOM, and that virtual DOM is built on top of a MIT licensed framework called Snapdom. And so, with Vue, you know, 1.x, from my understanding, there was not a virtual DOM story. And so, with that, um, all of your your DOM updates were actually done kind of on the fly, and there wasn't any virtualization. But but with the inclusion of sna- of uh, a variation of Snapdom. Um, now the updates that need to be made to the DOM, uh, only the only the changes are propagated. So everything happens super super fast. It's it's really really nice. And that must obviously you know help the the performance story there. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> cool. But on the on the on the DOM and, and the virtual DOM and those kind of things, do you know how, if at all, um, Vue.js plays with with web components? Um, I know you know in, in other frameworks that utilize a virtual DOM, there's often some caveats in using kind of native web components in those virtual environments. Are you familiar with with any of those kind of questions? So um, I've I've tried to integrate some web components, and um, I've I've been able to do that successfully. Um, I'm not aware of any caveats. I have not dived really deep into that, but I do know that Vue itself actually has its own component story. Um, and so with with those components you can build uh build components inside of Vue much the same way you could do with uh React or or you know in Angular you had directives and so um inside of 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 Vue you can have custom elements that you you build with um as components. Uh one of the things that's really compelling I feel is that well there's two things. Uh you can actually create single file components so you can really define your your component into a, a single file, um, and then the other part of it is, is that the the view library, the core library, is really really small and really really compact. So um, it's really easy to bring that view component story into an existing app and leverage view just for the components if you want. Um, and I think I think last time I checked, you know that. The, the Vue core library is roughly 27 kilobytes gzipped um, when minified. And so that gets across the wire very really quickly. And by the time you, you know, cache that or whatever, it's a really minimal um, 
impact on your app to give you such a powerful feature. Um, so this is this is kind of tied to that. While we're still talking about um, some uh, some virtual DOM stuff and some um, some web component stuff, uh, do you know if um, uh, Views Virtual DOM or, or, or Snap DOM or uh, whatever it was you said that they were using exactly do the, do they use native uh, do they use native event listeners for the web or do they have a synthet or does it use a synthetic event system like React? It might be it might be a little bit too much in the weeds for for this uh, for this specific uh, for this I, I, specific <laughs> topic. But trick question. Uh, no, I I I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry, I haven't uh, okay dug that deep into it. But uh, that's that's a very valid question. Well, so so um for a little bit of background, the reason that I ask is um that's one of React's um uh, uh hurdles for using um native web components or custom elements in uh, uh in React is it. General, if you're writing a custom a custom element, you'll probably you know you have your properties for your inputs, and then you'll use um, uh, custom events for uh, for outputs. Uh, but React binds to at least in its current form binds to attributes right away instead of properties that it doesn't know about, and it um, uh, uses a synthetic event system, which means that uh, it doesn't just automatically listen for custom events that would come out the way that um i even think a preact does and i know that uh that angular does but so um i actually might have to look into that a little bit and maybe uh we'll we'll post something um about it uh i know i'm gonna look into it (laughs) now now i'm curious (laughs) yeah no i i I hope i hope that i hope that it does because everything that makes it easy to integrate with web components the better in my opinion absolutely absolutely yeah and vaden who makes a lot of web components has some has a guide, I believe, on integrating with Vue, um, particularly uh, in regards to, I think, their date picker. So you can use uh, bindings and whatnot, uh, and they have a little example, which we'll put in the show notes for those who are interested in just how you might do that. Sweet. All right. Uh, so uh, so this I'm trying to remember this about about Vue, and I think I remember correctly. Does Vue have a special property in... It's um, uh, component configuration for handling observables. Um, yes, so so there are kind of a couple things there. Um, Vue has this concept called computed properties, um, which computed properties are a way of having kind of a, a cached property on on a um, a field. So if you Basically, what that means is that changes will only get propagated through the the template um, if the property value itself changes. So even if you set it, if you set it to the the value that it was before, that change won't necessarily get propagated out through uh, the template. And so that once again also impacts the performance of the app. Right? Um, it just kind of does a, a, a few less changes than than are absolutely uh, required. So that's um, that's really handy. Okay, but so so I f- I feel like I remember seeing before that you could actually just define that oh this this value is going to be an observable and you could use it in the template without having to bother uh, you know like manually subscribing to the observable or anything like that. Maybe I'm making that up though, but I don't think I was. Well, there's there's the data property itself, which uh, the the data object within a, a view instance, um, is kind of serves as the view model behind uh, behind a view instance. You also have that data component, uh, that data object on a view component itself. Um, and the other part of it is there's also a, and maybe this is what you're referring to. There's also a a props object. Which allows you to define custom attributes on a web com- or on a component within View, and so the way that works then is that um, much like React, data flows down. Uh, there's one-way data flow within View, and so the data flows from the parent elements down to the child elements. Um, if you run into a situation where you actually have to, you know, uh, push data up from your child elements up. up through the visual tree to your your parents or grandparents or you know any of the ancestors, um, you you actually use an event to propagate uh, or broadcast those changes up the tree. 
Cool, uh, cool deal. Um, so I actually found. So I do know what you're. T- I do know what you're talking about. I actually, I found the thing that I was thinking about, and it's not part of you property proper. It's a, uh, a, a I guess a, a a plugin or something like that for view called ViewRx. Um, that I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes so that I'm so I'm not just making stuff up <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, but it is, uh, but it is something kind of cool. Um, that is uh, that is there. But um, yeah, it's cool. Thank you for that and thank you for uh so i assume that's something so you can easily in uh interface view with rxjs is that right i I believe so yeah i believe so yes which is which is really cool because that's actually that's one of the things i like about angular specifically is the the async pipe um and um uh, and so like i think this will let you do something kind of similar but it but it is a plug-in we'll we'll, uh we'll put a link in the uh, in the show notes for anybody that's interested about that specifically Cool. cool great so we mentioned um, tooling a little bit earlier. Um, what, what's the tooling story for Vue? Like, yeah, is there lots of tooling involved to get started, or is it relatively lightweight? Yeah, what's the story there? So I I feel it's relatively lightweight. Um, if uh, you know to help you get started, there is an optional command line tool. Uh, the tool can be used to kind of help you scaffold an app with with Webpack or Browserify. Um, there are also templates if you're building a progressive web app or, or if you just have a simple, you know, single page app, um, there are templates for that. But this is only needed if you're building a larger app, right? So personally, if you're going to, exp- in my opinion, if you're going to experiment with Vue or if you have just a smaller app, um, I like to just import the library via CDN to get started um, and kind of skip the whole command line interface um, and, and just, just like I said, bring that library in that way so that um, you can see if Vue is something that you're actually interested in first. Um, and then in terms of, you know, actually editing my code, um, I like to use Visual Studio Code personally. Um, and I know that for Visual Studio Code, there's an extension called Vitor. Uh, I hope I pr- I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> but um, Vitor provides auto-completion and error-checking uh, formatting, syntax highlighting, and and some debugging features. So, um, I found it to be a super handy extension, and it's it's really well done. Um, and then the the Vue.js team itself, um, if you're debugging um, or while you're debugging your app in the browser, there's actually an extension for Chrome and Firefox called uh, Vue.js Dev Tools, and and those those kind of help make uh, debugging a lot easier as you know as you're working with the properties the properties themselves are are reactive and so what that entails is creating some getter and setter functions behind the scenes where if you were just using the console tools um it'd be kind of cumbersome to actually (laughs) dig in and see the values in some of your in your data structure but the uh the dev tools extension actually helps with that yeah, I've used something similar um, for Angular as well, which is really quite nice. It's nice to see that they've got those kind of tools for Vue as well. Brilliant. So in terms of the tooling story, having sort of gone through the documentation and seen what Vue has, you know, there is a recommendation to sort of use the unminified version in development. Mm-hmm. And admittedly, this somewhat bothers me uh, <laughs> because I you find that every time... It, 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 I mean, do you see a lot of developers, uh, since you're working with them out there with Vue, do you see people who misunderstand the need to switch to the production branch for performance reasons? Like, because I know this is not just a Vue thing. Like, there's lots of frameworks that say, hey, make sure that you, before you deploy to production, to make sure you flip that flag or switch your build. I mean, are you seeing that problem? Because to me, it, it, it gives me... It gives me pause because I don't like to see unperformant things deployed. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely understand the the concern. Um, I haven't witnessed it much myself, primarily because a lot of times I'm building enterprise type apps, and so with that, the the whole build story is kind of an important part of the architecture. And once you kind of think of it through that way, you're you're generally going to load Vue itself via, um, you know, something like Webpack or Browserify, or um, maybe you'll install Vue via NPM, and you know you'll have a, a you know a gulp process that actually bundles and uglifies and minifies you know all of your your JavaScript libraries into one bundle, right? Um, 
So I, I haven't seen that a lot. I'm sure that it happens. Um, but I think, um, once again, I think, I, I think it's really great the way that view just makes it easy to get started. And then you can kind of make the jump to those tools as you need them, but they're not, not a requirement from day one. Um, I think it is a hard thing to do. Um, admittedly because when you have something that is inherently very complicated um uh or uh, sorry complicated is not the right word uh inherently very deep where you have a framework that has a lot of functionality that it brings you but at the same time the you know there is a trade off there right in terms right, of right. the if it's easy to spin so that i can develop out is the developer who is deploying that thing understand that, for instance, the DevTools console exists, of which I see a lot of. All, I mean, a lot of people who are getting started don't understand the entire web development tooling story, which is, right. you know, sort of an ongoing debate. Um, right. But it is hard to do, right? It's, you know, there's there's inherently trade-offs within any sort of thing. And, and Vue has a significant section on production deployment tips, particularly with the build tools. I mean, they basically tell you exactly how you should be doing this, particularly in Webpack and Browserify. Um, I mean, they even have a roll-up plugin um, for uh, Replace. So, I mean, this is convenient, but I do, you know, if you're out there listening, do read the documentation. Uh, <laughs> the, the documentation is very good, uh, yeah. and it has your production deployment tips for you. Um, you you've mentioned, Chad, um, that you use... Um, VS Code, and I think you mentioned you use Webpack. Uh, it'd be great to hear kind of your general Vue.js like development setup. You know, all the toolings you use. Do you use Gulp or anything like that? If you could just give a bit more insight on um, those things, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I mean, it uh, it's it's always an evolving story, so it's it's kind of relevant to to when someone's listening to this podcast, I guess. But um, you know, myself, I I my background was actually really heavily in the the .NET space, and I came across Node in about uh, 2011, maybe it's 2012. And um, the way that I actually came across it was because um, I had a, I believe it was a knockout app, and I came across Grunt. Um, so Grunt was a build automation tool to help you do those things like, you know, minifying your files and whatnot. And I was very compelled by that. I thought that was very intriguing and whatever. And um, that kind of started me down the rabbit hole of, of working with node and whatnot. And, um, then I moved on to, um, gulp. And, and the reason that I liked gulp was because, um, gulp kind of, um, connected with me as a developer. Um, the tasks were, you know, you actually wrote the code for the tasks, whereas grunt was more of a configuration based system. Um, and then I think we, you know, fast forward a little bit, and Webpack was something that um, uh, I think I first started tinkering around with it about a year ago, um, which what's interesting there is it's back to kind of the configuration approach. Um, so I, I have Gulp, and then Gulp is actually calling, I have Gulp calling Webpack, and, um, I, but I rely, on, uh, I rely on Webpack to take care of my client side stuff as much as possible, but I still have Gulp as uh, handling kind of trying to do stuff on the server side and then triggering off that triggering off the client side tasks, if, if you will. Am I rambling, <laughs> rambling a little bit? No, no, no. That's really good to hear. Just just nice to hear other people's setups or what people are using um, you yeah. know, with these kind of projects. Obviously, like you said, it's going to completely depend on what project you're working on, um, you know, what day of the week it is. You know, next week there'll be a completely new tooling system. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but it's, it's still nice to hear. Thank you for that. Um, that I, I do think we we're just talking about the changing tooling landscape, um, which we, we've we've talked about on this show before. Uh, um, also remember that there is the 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 view like a dedicated view CLI, right? So so like if you don't know what to do and you're just start and like you want to go like a little bit past, you know, like okay, let's include the script on the page. I want I want to mess around with some other stuff. Um, there are some kind of pre built tools that are uh, that make it easier for you to get started, and then you can go in and uh, kind of like. Um, build custom tooling as you need to because sometimes you do need to absolutely absolutely i do enjoy the fact that it seems like 
every larger library slash framework these days has a CLI tool. Maybe just because I like the CLI. But yeah. I dig the fact that there is some simplicity to what can often be madness in which was, how in the world do I set up a build process? Why does this not do the thing that I wish it did? Um, because you're right. A lot of times you do need custom build processes, particularly when you're dealing with more complex systems. But those things can be also their own engineering feat of magic. Um, and no one likes magic in a build process. <laughs> At least I don't like magic in a build process. Everyone... Yeah, and, and every once in, every once in a while, you end up just doing something kind of kind of kludgy. Um, but if it's hidden behind a nice uh, a nice black box in the form of a pre built CLI, you don't have to think about it. Are you tell Are you telling me that my Z shell <laughs> build system with Make is kludgy? Is is that what you're saying? Did you see that repo? Doggone <laughs> it, Danny! No one's supposed to know about it. Just Look, chaos. <laughs> I just know I just know that I've done things in the past to like optimize builds um, that I'm not particularly proud of. For example, modifying source code in node modules um, as a pre-build step. <laughs> yeah, I thought that maybe, was a requirement for most I'm things. Saying, I'm saying maybe I've done that before. I'm not saying that I'm proud of it necessarily. <laughs> Take it, own it, Danny. Be proud. Be <laughs> proud that the build worked. That's I think. Anytime the build, you know, you know what, you know why they have green checkboxes on build because you got to feel good about it at the end of the day. <laughs> That's why it's like you know you could just have a message you know with white text that says you know oh, you know you're complete and you've done it. But no checkboxes and confetti. That's I set off an alarm now in the office and every time the build works, yeah. I feel that's the best way to go. Uh, really raises morale. <laughs> All right, we're we're veering we're veering again, Justin. Um, uh, but yeah, so back, but back to view specifically. So we're talking about we're talking about tooling, talking about some of the pre-built tools that Vue has. Um, uh, but we've been primarily talking about um, uh, you know browser targeted applications. Um, you know, React has React Native and a server side rendering thing. You know, like Angular has the the you know the platform server and native script. Um, does d it is Vue built? Um, to target additional platforms other than just the browser? Um, so there, there is a custom rendering function um, that opens the doors to that. But um, there are actually two main projects that kind of enable you to use Vue for native development. Um, the first project is one that I really enjoy. In fact, I was actually working with this technology before I was working with Vue, before I even heard of Vue. Um, and that project is called Native Script. Um, I really enjoyed Native Script and find it to be a powerful story. It's um, uh, backed by a company called Progressive, which uh, pro I, I th Progressive bought a company named Telerik, which Telerik for a long time had b um, built, um, you know, a lot of the rich components uh, developers used. Um, you know, before there was this plethora of open source stuff um, available to us today. Um, and so there's a lot of, lot of uh, experience in building these great frameworks. Um, and so if you haven't checked out NativeScript, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's great. I really, truly enjoy that framework. Um, there's a second project um, that actually kind of had uh, native or added view, uh, native support to view code before native script did. And that project's called weeks. Um, that's spelled W E E X. Um, it looks pretty impressive, but I personally haven't uh, had the opportunity to work with it. Um, so there are definitely several opportunities to, uh, take your view experience and deploy that into, uh, you know, your iOS and your Android environments. Um, and uh, there's a there's another project for server side rendering too. I'm I'm the the name of it is escaping me. Um, uh, yeah, and I was gonna say Vuex, but that's the uh, that's the state management plugin. And now I'm my mind Nuxt. is it's called Nuxt. Nuxt. There you go. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, do do you, do you have any experience with uh, with Nuxt? Uh, could you uh, do, like anything interesting you could tell us about it? I you know I do not have any experience with Nuxt. Um, it's on my uh, it's on my radar here to look at probably next week. So I'm just not there yet. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, but uh, it, it seems like it is. Uh, but Nuxt seems like it is from. Uh, it's a, an official view um, product, uh, if you will. Um, so it's 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 not third party. I think this is from the View team. That's correct. I do know that much. Yeah. Which is excellent. Right. It, 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 I like I, I like it. That's one of the things I like from uh, from View. It's like that the the kind of the core team manages several core packages, like um, you know, like for the the router and Nux and uh, stuff like that. I, I like that that happens. I, I feel co- very comfortable um, uh, when when teams do that kind of stuff. Agreed. So you know, like the the router is officially supported by the team. Um, the command line is officially supported by the team. The UX, the, the, the state management thing I mentioned is managed by the team. And, um, all that just kind of helps, I don't know, it makes things easier to learn and pick up. Right. Um, because it's kind of a, a common pattern shared across these various plugins, if you will. Well, and there's also just a, a certain level of trust as well, um, uh, you know, like I, I, tr- I, you know, like I, I inherently trust the native. It's, it's so it's actually one of my one of the things with Angular. It's you know, like I, I trust that the packages from the Angular team are going to work, and I trust they're going to be kept up to date and all that kind of stuff. And it's the same uh, the same with with Vue. Right, right. So you mentioned a kind of thing at the beginning of of this episode um, that you can bolt on the pieces of functionality as and when you need them. So it's not like a huge big thing right at the beginning. You can like you know add the router or the state management and those kind of things. Um, so specifically on the state management side of things, um, could you do something like not use the view recommended state management setup and maybe use something like Redux, or is that just like a not not a done thing? Or so um, the a lot of the um uh, the complementary libraries like the router and the state manager are implemented as, as plugins to view. So um, you can definitely bring in your own state management um, a library if you want, as long as it, it, as long as it has the plugin interface, if you will. Um, I know that um, the router, for example, that while there is the view router, there's also support for director JS. If you, you know, if, if you've used, uh, if you've used another router in the past that you're more familiar with, you can kind of uh, fairly easily import that in as a, as a plugin for uh, Vue.js. And so, That's really good to know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's actually an example of that too, because I think you, I think there's an example that someone set up for Page.js. So if you use the Page.js Page.js uh, router, you can use that with Vue. Yep. And um, back on the. Uh, on Redux, so I'm currently playing around with Redux, so it's my hammer and everything's a nail. Um, <laughs> and is is uh, view and Redux a thing that people do? Is it um, a, a common pattern, or is it something that nobody does because the you know view handles state management perfectly fine by itself? So, uh, from what I've from my personal experience, I seem to come across uh, people relying more on on Vuex. Which is the state man- central state management plugin for Vue? Uh, I don't have much experience with React personally, um, so uh, you know there's definitely a chance that individuals are are looking into that. But um, from from my experience, Vuex is kind of the the story for for central state management in in larger applications. Cool. I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah, there's actually I I think there's I want to say there's a lib for using redux in view I, I think it's called review i want i, I want to say that's the case uh, in which case it's basically some bindings that you put on and then you can use it uh good name. i thought it was a pretty good name too <laughs> and you watch i'm gonna be wrong it's like no it's like uh, that but i'm pretty sure it's called review <laughs> they definitely didn't use the name generator like all the other things we've just been talking about <laughs> um so, I, uh, so just in terms of all the other things that you can do with uh, do with Vue, um, do they have? Um, uh, uh, is there TypeScript support for Vue? I mean, I guess you could write your own typings if you wanted to, but is there a, a you know a, a core set of typings that are, that are maintained so that you can uh, write Vue components with um, with TypeScript? I I have seen TypeScript uh, usage in, with Vue. Um, I don't know if that's supported by the actual team or if that is more of a third party implementation. Um, one of the things that's pretty compelling in um, uh, going back to the web components story is um, 
with the single file components, you kind of have the opportunity to choose the language in um, in both the so there's a style block that kind of handles the per instance uh, you know you, uh, stylings for the component as well as the the functional code which is in a script block, and within each of those you can actually plug in language components which then if you run them through the tool chain will do the the compilation into their um, components. So um, I would suspect that to handle TypeScript, you you could you know set the language in in that that script block um, for TypeScript and, and run with it that way. Very cool. Um, I'm also just digging through some uh, digging through doc uh, digging through more documentation stuff, which I'll so like there is a a uh, TypeScript section in the uh, in the guides for V2, and I'll I'll make sure that those are also in the doc because uh, it, pretty much I want to do everything in TypeScript. Okay. At this, at, at, at this point, um, it actually uh, I. I was recently started messing around with something that was not with TypeScript, and it's at this point it's just been what I've been doing for long enough that not having it makes me sad. So, I, so I so I always so I always have to check because if I was going to start doing some view stuff, I I would do what I could to um to use TypeScript. Gotcha, gotcha. So in terms of. I mean, we're kind of getting into the advanced section of you at this point. We're talking about TypeScript. We're talking about SSR. We're talking about all the wonderful good things. I mean, I mean, how much how much code can you reuse in a Vue.js sort of set of components or application? I mean, you've got the concept of mixing them plugins, for instance, uh, and those look pretty trick. I mean, do you find that people use them quite a bit to give yourself the ability to make some more reusable code within those applications? So I I think that. I you know Vue has been kind of on a a rapid adoption over the last year, um, and so I think we're kind of at this point where um, some of these more advanced topics are starting to get um, evaluated, and uh, best practices are starting to emerge around it. And in my opinion, I feel like plugins are kind of one of the most underutilized things in the Vue ecosystem right now. Um, and so with, you know, with plugins, it, it make a lot of sense to import, um, you know, a library, like a UI library for a lot of things. Um, for instance, maybe like a, like a material design implementation or, or, or fluid design implementation or something of that nature, um, where you could have a, a library of components that you import as a, as a plugin. Um, I also think that, um, um, so way back in view one, there was this concept of filters, which there were several baked in filters that let you do some, you know, some, some text transformation type stuff. Um, filters still exist in view two, but there's not really a, a global library of, uh, of filters. And I think that that would be helpful if there was like a plugin around, um, uh, maybe like Moment.js, for instance, if there was a plugin around Moment.js to help you quickly import some of those utility functions as filters so that you can quickly use those in your, your HTML templates, for example. Um, so I think, I think it's just kind of a personal opinion, but I think we're going to kind of start to see more, you know, best practices really emerge here uh, in the second half of this year and, and start up next year. It intrigued me that plugins and mixins. I mean, if you look at the way that sort of you describes them, uh, just in terms of actually building one, uh, it intrigues me only because it's probably if you've written JavaScript for a while, the patterns are very probably familiar. I mean, a plugin is basically a module pattern sort of uh, expression. Uh, mixins are basically uh, object literal. So. Right. You know, it's, uh, you know, looking at them to, to some extent, it brings me slight joy only because I look at it and go, ah, <laughs> I've written those forever. Like yeah. I, I can I've write seen one of those before. right now. Yeah. It's, it's very accessible is what I would say. Right. Right. Agreed. Yes. What else should we talk about? Peoples? Because we've covered a lot. Very, we've, we've, very open-ended question. It is. Uh, well, I'm just curious. We've talked quite a bit about things. I mean, what have we missed, Chad? Like, what's the thing that we're not asking that everybody should know about Vue.js? 
Is it awesome? Yes. <laughs> it looks pretty that's awesome. Fair. We did. We did. That's fair. We did not ask that very specific question. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. It, it it sounds it sounds really good. It sounds like uh, it, it sounds like a framework that w- that really aimed to give a lot of developers what they wanted, but making sure to stay. Uh, true. So that's a terrible. That's not the way that I wanted to put it. But making sure that the that the overall view, as it were, of the framework was uh, you know like was still you know, was still was still guided because you know developers will ask for will ask for the moon, not knowing exactly what they need. And it seems like they've right. they've struck a very uh, it seems like they've struck a very good balance of what to include, what not to include, what to leave to third parties, uh, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I, you know, when I first got started with Vue, one of the reasons that I kind of latched onto it was how quickly I was able to actually get something out the door and up on the web. Um, I felt like, you know, I, I saw the documentation, I, you know, went through the getting started and uh, just kind of started playing around with it. And, you know, I had something up in just a couple hours. Um, and so I was kind of freed from a lot, a lot of the complexity I've seen with other frameworks. Um, I felt like I felt productive kind of immediately, which the last time I kind of felt that way was with, uh, I think jQuery. Uh, so, um, really a, a breath of fresh air in my opinion. Um, so you yourself have, like you've mentioned before, you've done some training courses. Um, you've done one already out on Vue.js getting started. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that and, and let everybody know kind of what's in there um, and how they, how they can find it? Sure. So um, I've written a training course on Vue.js called Vue.js Getting Started. Um, That training course is a a beginner level training course on Pluralsight. It primarily covers a lot of the rendering uh, type topics. So you'll be able to create um, uh, some basic apps. It does not talk about, you know, some of the stuff we've talked about on this podcast. There's no discussion of routing um, or, or state management. It's really based around uh, the templating story and um, uh, kind of the the example used in the training course is creating a beer search engine. So um, you get kind of practical code that you can see working. You can download it. Uh, there are, I believe, 110 code examples included with the course. Um, so it's very, um, it's beginner ready in my opinion. Cool. Um, so if you've got a Plural Site subscription, then you know that's the, the course to check out if you want to learn more about getting started with Vue.js. And of course, we've already mentioned loads of times that um, the documentation itself is really good, so you can go on there and, and learn more about Vue.js. Well, Chad, thank you so much for coming on to the program today. Uh, if people want to get, reach out and sort of contact you, uh, where are you at on the inner tubes? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you guys for having me on as a guest. I, I really, really appreciate it. And I, I hope I was able to answer your questions. Um, online, you can find me on Twitter at Chad Campbell, all one word. Um, and I I'm, I'm, guess we'll put that down in the resource notes as well. You bet, because if there's anybody like me, you probably can't spell. Um, <laughs> and I feel you out there, people. I That's why I have IntelliSense. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, Leon, Danny, good episode. Good things. Any other questions yeah, no, before we wrap it up? No, just uh, uh, Chad. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, we've been wanting to we've been wanting to talk about View for uh, for a little bit, so it's uh, um, really happy to finally get to do it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Chad. Great having you on. And this has been episode number one hundred and thirty-two of the Web Platform Podcast. And we've talked to Chad Campbell today about Vue.js. Leon, Danny, thank you so much again for hosting with me this week. And for all of you out there listening, we will see you next week.